Okay. So welcome, welcome once again, and glad that you're here. We have um, quite a bit of uh, participants today, which we absolutely love and greatly appreciate you spending a little bit of your time uh, with us to learn about careers and in interpretation. So um, I've heard from a couple of our speakers saying, you know, I wish I had that uh, before I started my career just to figure out what I wanted to do or where to go. So we, we're hoping to continue doing um, some of these town halls to inform our community and really, really highlight the power of being my, uh, bilingual and multilingual and, um, you know, have such a great perspective of different cultures. So we're hoping to continue doing that uh, through our organization. So just wanted to tell you a little bit about Natissel. Natissel is an organization that was born uh, in 2019. We are a nonprofit organization and we love that we have quite a, a variety of uh, members that represent 28 states and 15 languages. Um, and we work with uh, a diverse group of uh, community members. Um, one of them is, of course, multilingual families. Uh, we work with educators, with school representatives, but also with interpreters and translators. And our focus is interpreting in education. And so really our, our main goal is to, um, number one, uh, create standards for interpreters who work in education because we didn't have those before. Um, and really to make sure that we elevate the professionalism of the interpreters that work with our students. Um, and so um, we do that through many different avenues. One of them is, is definitely creating the actual standards. So we created a code of ethics for interpreters and translators in education where we didn't have one before. Um, and we are working on their standards of practice so that we can create a foundation for, for what it is that we do. Um, we work in a, in a very um, collaborative um, model. So we work with many different states, you know, um, and many different languages. So we're, you know, we really want to be seen as, as an organization that is not just Spanish only. Uh, we want to be inclusive of all of the languages that we, we can possibly include. Um, and really have them as part of the conversations. Um, we do have advisory boards because we do not know everything and we need a lot of help. So we do work with uh, multilingual families who actually have created tools so that we can empower families to um, really voice their concerns about interpreting in education and the quality of the interpreters that they have and also advisory boards that um, include, again, uh, languages other than Spanish to create resources and materials for those that we have um, here in our, in our state and nationwide. Um, we do offer professional development opportunities. So I, I encourage you to explore our website. We have lots of um, different types of professional development uh, activities for interpreters in education. So as you hear the conversation today and you really feel that that's an area where you want to start or you know, grow into, feel free to um, reach out and kind of explore what, what we have because we have quite a bit of resources that are, that are free for our community. Um, we also uh, do a really good job creating and developing additional resources. So our advisory committees kind of tell us what we need to work on in terms of glossaries or information. And so this town hall, um, it's really a, a result of those conversations. So we really appreciate our advisory boards, you know, really telling us, uh, you know, how to, how to spend our resources and where to guide um, our knowledge and experience. So, and we are developing a national certification test for um, interpreters and translators in education. It is a big, humongous project. Um, but we were very happy to be able to create it because, you know, we have medical and legal and sign language interpreters who have already um, a certification process and we were feeling a little left out. And so we wanted to make sure that we created something that was based on research and that, you know, we actually um, could really uh, validate our, our work. So, so our members uh, make this happen. So we greatly appreciate our, our membership, uh, you know, for creating opportunities like these. And so, you know, I encourage you to, to explore our website again and to see the benefits of, um, of our members. And really, you know, we, we had a, a meeting just last night where it was just amazing to see the progress that we have made as an organization, um, but also the visibility that we're getting in, in you know, national and 
state conferences and advocacy efforts that were, that were continuing. Um, and really our interest has always been to make sure that our families and our educators get the best interpreters that they are. Um, so with that and said, you know, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be able to um, really introduce our speakers um, and, and really, you know, gain from their experience. What we're hoping that that happens today is to have you know, perhaps 15 minutes to 20 minutes per speaker where they're going to talk about, you know, their, their experience as interpreters um, or in the case of, of Patrick, that, you know, his experience as an educator and, and school leader um, and really open it up for questions. We want to be, you know, very informal, um, you know, feel free to ask questions because this is what it's what it's about um, we want to make sure that you leave with some idea of you know how to start as an interpreter how to continue growing as an interpreter and really you know where to take it from here so you know take advantage of the time that we have and really think about questions as you go through we are going to be monitoring the chat so if you feel like you know something you know somebody something that somebody said and you really want to ask that question you can put it on the chat um, and Dr. Uh, Pendergrass is, is checking the chat, making sure that we are uh, keeping track of your questions, okay? Um, so with that in mind, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Pendergrass, who is also a board member of NATISO, and she is here as our wonderful um, tech support person and really to monitor our, our chat, um, but she's also going to introduce our beautiful and wonderful guest speakers, so Jennifer. Thank you. Um, so first, I'm, I'm so honored to be introducing these amazing speakers today. The first speaker that I'm going to introduce to you is Romina Espinoza. Romina is a professional Spanish and English interpreter and a small business owner based in San Diego, California. She's been providing language services since 2017. Romina holds a BA in International Studies from University of California, San Diego, and a minor in Spanish Literature completed at the University of Granada, and an MA in Gender and Diversity Studies from University of Interpretation, Spanish English, from University of uh, California, San Diego Extension. Ms. Espinoza is recognized in the United States as a certified healthcare interpreter, Spanish, um, through the Certifi Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters, CCHI. Her areas of expertise include conference, community, including special education, immigration, medical, and mental health interpreting. When Romina is not interpreting, she spends her time running outdoors, a five-time international marathon runner, being creative through acrylic painting or writing poetry, or being present for her loved ones. Welcome, Romana. Okay, here is our next speaker, Patrick Wallace. Patrick Wallace currently serves as the program specialist for uh, world languages and global workforce initiatives with the Georgia Department of Education. He sits on the board of several nonprofit agencies related to the international education and travel and is a published author. He also currently serves as the president for the National Council for State Supervisors of Foreign Languages. He's a former German teacher of 25 years and is an advocate for international education and building global educational connections, as well as a strong supporter of dual language immersion and world language language programs in the United States. Our next speaker is Lorena Castillo. Lorena is a trilingual interpreter, Spanish, ASL, and English, nationally certified through two national organizations for spoken language interpreters, the NBCMI and CCHI in Spanish. She has over 15 years of experience as an interpreter and seven years of experience as an interpreter trainer and mentor. Currently, she works as the training manager at AMN Healthcare in the Language Services Division. She has completed a variety of training programs for both Spanish interpreting and ASL interpreting, including an ASL medical interpreting fellowship, a medical terminology certificate, and a medical interpreting certificate. In addition to her three working languages, she speaks intermediate Italian and basic Swahili. Uh, and 
Anna Soler is the chairperson of the National Association of Educational Translators and, Translators and Interpreters of Spoken Languages. She completed her degree in social work at Georgia State University, her master's in public health at Emory University, and is a PhD in special education student at the University of Georgia. For over a decade, Anna worked with the largest school district in Georgia as the language services and parent outreach coordinator, developing, implementing, and evaluating professional development opportunities for multilingual personnel, as well as discovering endless opportunities to engage multilingual families in their children's education. Anna has authored interpreter training curricula nationally, including the Intercultural Parent and Youth Leadership Program, the Interpretation Academy for Bilingual High School Students, the Arkansas Interpreter and Educational Credential Training, a 40-hour course for medical interpreters, and online courses for the University of Georgia, including the Professional Interpreter and Education Certificate course and the Professional Interpreter and Special Education Certificate course. Both courses have trained over 800 bilingual community members nationwide. So welcome to our expert speakers. Thank you very much, um, Jennifer. We greatly appreciate you introducing us and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and uh, give the floor to Romina, who is our first speaker. And again, if you are just arriving, welcome, welcome, glad to have you here. Um, we are recording this um, town hall and we're hoping to have um, a little bit of time after our speakers have their presentations to actually open it up for questions. We love to see you on camera. We love for you to speak up and, and ask your questions if you feel comfortable. And if not, you can put it on the chat and Dr. Pendergrass will be monitoring um, your questions. So, all right, Romina, floor is yours. There we go. Can you hear me fine, everybody? Just checking. Awesome, cool. All righty, let me set this PowerPoint, maximize. And let's get started. All right, so whew, I'm not a public speaker. I am an interpreter, but I am here because I am happy to share some knowledge and information and learn from everybody else in our room today. So. Let's get it started. <laughs> so my presentation is titled The Paths to Becoming a Medical Interpreter. Uh, my name is Romina Espinosa, and today we, we, we will be going about a few items. I'll share a little bit about my bio, how I became an interpreter, uh, what is a medical interpreter, and how we can become an, a medical interpreter. I'm also going to share about the, skill, the skills needed to thrive in the profession. Um, I'll share a little bit about where medical interpreters work in case you're wondering that and uh, what interpreting modalities we utilize and what that even means and the pros and cons about the profession because yes, you guessed it, uh, not everything is perfect in life and it's definitely not perfect in our field, but here we are and we're doing it. <laughs> a little bit about me. Uh, that was me back in the 90s, a happy little girl. I'm still a happy little girl. She's still living inside. <laughs> I immigrated from Peru at a young age with my mother to the United States. And, um, you know, I did take some English classes as a, as a little kid back in my, in my homeland. Um, but when I came to the States, it hit me because vegetables and numbers didn't get me anywhere. <laughs> And trying to figure out how to say the time or how to find a bus stop was definitely a challenge. Uh, but you learn and you pick, up, you pick up the language. For me, I picked up English at school uh, at a pretty young age. So that was definitely valuable. Um, as, as it was shared, I do have a bachelor's degree and a master's. Um, and eventually later, I pursued also in the liberal arts um, a certification in translation and interpreting for my language combination, which is Spanish and English. And uh, yeah, as it was also stated, when I'm not interpreting, I love to spend time with that buddy over there. And uh, we like to run together. 
uh, and uh, I can be a bit of an introvert. I love I love solitude and silence since I'm, I'm the only child. So I like to paint and I like to write poetry and I like to spend time with with my family, especially with with the elderly. I treasure my grandmother who happens to be here in San Diego with me. So uh, it's always just wonderful to be with her. Next. My story as an interpreter. It was 2017 and I was looking for a job. I had just uh, returned from, from Spain for, from pursuing a master's and I was like, what next? It took me a few months to figure out my next chapter in life professionally, finding a job. So I started volunteering for a local nonprofit and it turns out that they needed interpreters. Uh, at, different at different hospitals throughout San Diego County, which is a pretty large city. And they, the organization has volunteer doctors who, uh, who offer surgeries pro bono uh, for patients who do not have health insurance, because as you might be aware, healthcare is not a universal right in the United States. So a lot of doctors volunteer uh, their free time and so did uh, interpreters offering that language access services. The organization only gave me like a one day training and I thought, wow, it was eye opening. It was fascinating to me. So I started going places. I started having interaction with the community who needed the language services to communicate with doctors, with medical staff. And I realized I, I, I can do this for a living. So by getting involved, by putting yourself out there, that's what, when I realized a, a true passion as a professional. So I continued my education. I learned about what it means to interpret, what it means to translate. Um, and I, I share my passions with some of my, some of my um, hobbies with you because you really have to get to know yourself and know what you like and, and go with it, really believe in it because everybody is so unique. I didn't start this right out of high school or right out of college. It took me years to figure it out. And, uh, and here I am interpreting uh, for a living full time. So what is a medical interpreter and how to become one? I would say a medical interpreter is somebody who follows national codes of ethics, and there are many. And at the end of this PowerPoint presentation, I do offer resources. I'll be more than happy to, to share with you this PowerPoint to take home and to look up at, at all of those resources. I can send it to our beautiful, wonderful Anna Soler, and she can distribute it later. Um, so a medical interpreter is somebody who communicates effectively a message between two parties. And uh, sorry, I have to do some cheat sheet here and take a look at my notes. <laughs> um, so yes, we offer, um, we are a cultural bridge between the speaker and somebody who doesn't understand the person in their native language. And, uh, in order, as I mentioned, I mentioned there is a code of ethics and uh, it is one of the code of ethics that I follow. It's the California Healthcare Interpreter Association. There is a website for that as well that I'll be happy to share. Um, and a trained professional interpreter follows something that is called a pre-session. And I like to think of, of a pre-session as an acronym that I learned back in school. It's known as CIFE. It means that we follow confidentiality. We interpret always in the first person because it helps managing the flow of the communication more effectively. Um, everything is faithfully interpreted. And if for whatever reason, there is something that the speaker or the doctor doesn't understand, we intervene in the third person interpreter speaking. There is misunderstanding here, if you could please clarify. Um, not only do we interpret language, I believe, but we also interpret culture because we communicate so differently when we speak in, when, and interact in one language as opposed to another. So we are that, that bridge, that messenger, if that makes sense. And to become an interpreter, I, I took a certification. It, it was 11 courses. 
but I know that there are quite a few programs now in the United States that offer bachelor's degrees, and even there are master's degrees and a few PhD programs nationwide. So if I would have known this back in my high school days, I would have gone for it. And before starting the meeting, uh, uh, Lorena was talking about it too. Like, I wish I would have had this kind of opportunity to, to connect uh, with, uh, with people like in this meeting to, to know where to go as an interpreter, but here we are. Um, so there is not one specific path. Uh, maybe you're pursuing another career and then you want to jump into interpreting. There, there are plenty of resources to become one. And uh, there are many skills needed to be as an interpreter and you can see it listed there, but the main highlight that I want to share is that it goes beyond being bilingual. You really need to learn the art, what it means to, uh, to interpret in a simultaneous mode, in a consecutive mode. Um, you really have to have good listening skills because you're taking in so much information, converting the message up here in your brain and then delivering it into, into another language. So there is so much mental processing going on. You really need to focus to what you're listening. A lot of interpreters also work over the phone and it's known as o OPI. Um, so you, again, you need that listening skill and you really need to have that telephone etiquette to communicate effectively. And I, I tend to go a lot to hospitals. So I do a lot of in-person interpretation in, in San Diego County. Diplomacy is key. Not everybody's gonna like you, but you have to think of the big picture. You're there to provide a service. Uh, and I think it's it's crucial to to get along with everybody and uh, and to show a spirit where you want to collaborate and you want to participate because um, so a lot of people don't understand the difference between what is a translator and what is an interpreter, right? I'm always get called. I'm always being told, oh, here's a translator, and you know, just kindly, oh, uh, yeah, yes, the interpreter is here. So, <laughs> you know, you can always correct in a kind way um, it, because you are an interpreter. You're doing a uh, verbal service. You're not translating a text. If that makes sense. Uh, let's see. So where medical interpreters can find work, I mentioned that in my case as a medical interpreter that I go to hospitals a lot. Uh, yeah, a lot of interpreters work in-house. There's clinics and hospitals and they get their full their full time benefits, 40 hours a week, uh, 401k plan, uh, health insurance benefits. There's also freelance interpreters like myself. I my I work on a weekly basis, different schedules. I set my own hours and I work through language agencies that give me offers and I either take it or not. And uh, there's never uh, bad feelings there because I'm an independent contractor. So uh, it doesn't mean that I'm gonna get fired because I'm not a language agency employee. So that's that's the, the freedom of freelancing, if, if that makes sense. And uh, direct clients, I am always doing what's called uh, it's called a cold calling or cold emailing. So um, I, I keep track of who I'm reaching out, like by having an Excel sheet and contacting different uh, nonprofits or uh, social services agencies nationwide. And, uh, and I, that's how I have been able to find uh, opportunities directly with, uh, with agents, with, uh, with nonprofits, for example, and uh, providing services at town hall meetings and events such as like uh, how where to find vaccination for the COVID-19 or uh, conversations on diabetes and other healthcare topics um, that are important to discuss in, in our communities. And uh, let's see. So the interpreting modalities, we have to be very flexible professionals and we are always utilizing in, in, in the medical setting uh, consecutive. That's like the main one. Consecutive means, let's say, the, the doctor is talking. Once they stop, the interpreter delivers the message into the language of the, of the, of the patient. Uh, and, and back again, uh, when the patient stops communicating, I, inter I, I start to speak. That's called consecutive. Uh, with site translation, I also do it all the time. There is medical history questionnaires that patients fill out. Uh, so I read it 
everything in extreme detail as it is said. And um, since a, a lot of the information has to be filled out in English for the provider to understand it, uh, I help out. I help out the patient writing it down exactly based on what they say. I don't add. I don't omit. It is exactly as what they say. That's what I write down. So that's the side translation when I'm when I'm reading the document and I'm telling them what it's saying for them to know. Simultaneous uh, can be. I do simultaneous mostly um, at uh, video remote interpretations when the provider, when it's a, it's a hybrid, it's a combination. I'm at a social services agency, for example, and the provider is on, it's on a video, right? So the provider is talking and the patient is next to me and I do shushotash or whispering. At the same time as the provider is speaking, I'm telling the patient everything that is going on that the, that the provider is saying. That kind of expedites the process uh, and it, it makes the, the communication feel very natural because I'm, I'm speaking at the same time that the doctor is saying something. So I, I notice uh, that people tend to, tend to like that mode of interpretation because it feels real, if that makes sense. Let's see. Um, yeah, just like I said in the beginning, nothing is perfect and there are pros and cons to, to the interpreting profession as a, as a medical interpreter. In the past four years, this is what, uh, what I have come to observe in the field. Um, the pros is that personally, I'm doing this because I love to help people uh, through communication. I love being that cultural bridge. And it's just such an amazing, fascinating emo feeling in my brain. It's, it's mental gymnastics. It's a workout when you're interpreting and when you're doing simultaneous, it's boom, boom, boom. It keeps on coming and you're, you keep on, uh, you keep on um, changing meaning and message. And it, it's so fascinating to, for the brain to have the capacity to do that. I, I love it. I also love that as a freelancer, I set my own schedule, my own hours. There's not one day that is ever the same or not one week. And I see so much and I learn, I learn so much. From, I learned so much medical vocabulary, a, a whole new medical condition that I didn't know. Um, and I'm always looking up and Googling information and there's always education. You always learn something new. There's new terms to learn. And, and that to me is very valuable. It's, it's lifelong learning. Uh, it's wonderful if you love being surrounded by people and you have this dynamic personality where you like change all the time. I personally love that, that it's never the same. Um, and again, if you love learning, this is your profession, definitely. Some of the cons would be that, yes, it is a competitive job market, but that's why there's continuing education and courses to always keep on learning and sharpening those language skills. Um, so yeah, believe in your talent and you will, you will make it, you will find opportunities. They will, I mean, at first you really have to be knocking on those doors, but your name, you, your, you are kind of also your name, your name becomes your brand. So get out there, make connections, networking is definitely key to, to make it in the industry. Um, also, let's see, it can feel very lonely. I, most of my colleagues are spread nationwide, especially with the pandemic. It's, it's very hard to socialize and have a coffee or a tea or a nice meal with the coworker because uh, personally, I, I'm a little bit afraid of the pandemic. I, I've seen it happening in my family um, among most of my loved ones. So I, I try to stay, stay away from socializing at the moment, um, but joining organizations and feeling part of a mission and that you belong will make a difference. You, it, it helps to get involved and to, and to advocate for the profession. Um, also, vicarious trauma is definitely real. So please do yourself a favor and practice self-care, running, exercising, uh, hiking, anything that helps you feel alive because we interpret in the first person. We see so much. We are kind of also like actors because we are playing the patient role and we are playing the surgeon the, or the doctor role in the medical field. So 
again, we see a lot and it's, it could be easy to internalize it if you don't find an outlet to let that out, you know, to have that clear professional boundary. And, and there is more talk on professional boundary in the codes of ethics. You can also look into that um, literature in a list of resources that I have provided here in the PowerPoint. So there is that. I don't know if I'm good with time, but I'll try to speed it up a little bit so we can give room to the next speakers. Again, I, I am a member of Metisol, which is a fantastic nonprofit organization where members come together and volunteer in the education interpreting. I'm also involved with other medical interpreting uh, organizations. So uh, yeah, uh, help out, get out there. It helps to feel good and to, to be part of something. Um, the main takeaway of my little speech here is to uh, please pursue an educational path to learn the craft. If it's a 40 hour program, if it's a bachelor's, a master's, get out there and do it. There are so many resources, so many scholarships. I think in a great reason of where I am today, it's because of great high school counselors that show me how to navigate getting into college. Otherwise, as an immigrant myself with my mother, I would have not known how to make it to college. And as, a, as one of my closest friends, Miss Christina Cunningham says, dream big. It's really possible to do it. Follow your dreams. And there are the resources. I will hand them over at the end. Um, books, podcasts, uh, dictionaries, uh, some of the jargon that I use today specific to the industry. So thank you so much. If you have any questions, there is my email. I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Romina. Um, if you do have any questions, you're welcome to put them on the chat. And like I said, we're gonna have a little bit of time after uh, the presentation so we can read your questions out or you can speak them out, uh, whichever makes you feel comfortable. So. I think now we have um, Patrick Wallace is our next speaker. And so um, look forward to learning from him. So Patrick, yep, I can see your presentation. Thank you. Perfect, thank you so much, Romina. It was great listening to that story. It's so awesome. And actually, actually I guess I would say that my work really spans a, a large area and I'm gonna come at it from a purely educational in many ways perspective, but a little background, uh, my name, you know, I work as a state supervisor of world languages. So not in all 50 states, but in 30 of our states, roughly, there are people who work within the departments of ed who oversee world language programs, support for world language, dual language immersion programs. And of course, every state works with their ESOL um, division as well. So in this capacity, I support all of our teachers across Georgia, we're the sixth largest school system in the United States. Um, and I support also a lot of work with international entities, nonprofits and others. And I, I'll kind of say that uh, I myself am bilingual as well. I speak German in addition to English and mi español no es muy mal, but it's, uh, it's getting better. I work a lot with uh, Spanish teachers and have the joy actually of supporting teachers across 15 different languages here in Georgia. Um, I come at this with a very passionate um, sort of perspective. And that is that I will tell you quite frankly that I believe the interpreting translating community will grow and continue to grow. And I believe on the educational side of things that the work is really um, the opportunities for people who are bilingual or multilingual is great and expanding. I know several of our districts have dedicated translation departments. So they do an outward facing communication in at least five different languages, depending upon the languages in that, um, in that system. And even there are now, and increasingly I see this, uh, bilingual bonuses. So for example, in, in one of our districts, there was a $3,000 additional bonus if you are bilingual and entering into the education profession. And, and I think several people here have that background there. They see the educational side very clearly. I can also say that in terms of where, so there's already this very close connection 
And one thing that's really apparent on the educational side is just the critical need for, and this is why I appreciate the work of this uh, group and Anna and others, of certifying, of finding and then developing national certification tests for various levels of education. I think in Georgia, I would love to see as my personal goal in many ways, the creation of a, a set of courses that uh, in the career technical side of our, um, our community to create a pathway for people to become interpreters. And, and that is a career pathway that I'd like us to develop more in the K-12 sector. I can say that we have some wonderful programs uh, where they are actually doing this. There's already um, bilingual or um, uh, really in, in the language. So we have courses that are truly delivered in Spanish at the high school level. Uh, but we also have programs where uh, students who have disability are on the pathway to become future educators or they're getting a look into the medical interpreting profession. Um, I know that there are um, districts that have um, interpreting translation academies that support their community in a lot of ways. So I think there's really just an incredible amount of opportunity for individuals who are um, bilingual, multilingual in the world to come. And that's just on the education side. I'm not talking of course, touching on the business side of that. And I always tell people, you know, uh, you can go to any major corporation and uh, especially if it's a service entity, it's gonna have in many ways an increasingly multilingual presence online. And of course, many of our multinational countries work across borders. Uh, so it's, it's just incredibly important. So having a language ability is really a multiplier for you in your career, whatever it is you decide to do. I'm going to make a strong case that you should enter in education um, and you can become an educational interpreter in that regard or translator as well. Um, I think that need is going to grow tremendously across our country. And I think in Georgia, that's that's definitely true. I know that um, court interpreting, uh, that's a really high standard. I know what I, of course, am not a professional interpreter or translator, but in we started a number of conversations in Georgia working with the in uh, these um, communities to try to figure out exactly what certifications were present. So I think there's a, a focusing going on where things are becoming a little clearer and more people are becoming engaged. And I just feel that uh, for you as individuals, if you are multilingual, um, we definitely uh, see a great future for you. On the education side, I'm, I, I'm always a little bit Georgia centric, although my work really impacts uh, a lot of things nationally. And I know that, but I always wanna encourage people with language talent to consider working in Georgia. We have such a great um, uh, community here and, and a great need an increasingly diverse, increasingly global community here. So we definitely want you in education. I definitely need world language teachers. There's a shortage of world language educators uh, in all states of our union. Uh, in Georgia, that is also the case, uh, it's particularly in dual language immersion. Uh, and then there's those, uh, there's also a lot of uh, growth in that area. Um, so that was a little kind of a lot of information at the start. And I knew when I came on here, I would never have time to really talk about all the different things that we're doing in this area. But I hope that my short presentation today will give you some insight into what's happening. And then also I would encourage you to reach out to me directly if you have any questions after today, my email I'll put, it's right there on the screen, of course. Uh, we're also very active on Twitter and Facebook, so you can follow us and see what we're doing as well on those platforms. Um, and you can just connect and let us know. My goal is if you want to become an educator and you are multilingual, multi, um, you have that talent, then I want to try to do my part in helping you along that pathway. And not only you, but really opening that gate uh, as much as we can. There are obstacles, for example, for dual language immersion teachers. If you're a non-native English speaker, um, certification tests across a great many states are still uh, having requirements of English only. So I think this is an area that needs to be worked on in many ways, just because I think for dual language immersion in particular, it may present an obstacle for 
uh, people who are uh, heritage speakers of a uh, language that we need, but may not be, or their English language isn't proficient enough to get over those entrance exams. So those are areas, for example, that we're working in. And uh, of course, this is some of the, some of what I work on in a lot of different ways. Um, so I guess I'm going to just kind of give you an update on what's happening in world language education and dual language immersion really nationwide and in Georgia as well. So I wear, as, I, as was alluded to in my opening there, that I wear two hats. So my first hat is of course, to support programs and teachers in Georgia. But the second hat is really to lead a national organization of people who do my job in states all around our country and try to move that um, further on a national scale. So working both at a national and state level. In Georgia, I'm really proud of what we're we can, what we have done. I've been on station here. I actually came from the German classroom. So I taught for 25 years as a German teacher before coming to the Department of Ed. And I've been here on station for five years. And we have done a, a tremendous amount. Um, and uh, we've, we, you would, if you explore our pages and I'll post some of that information later, you'll begin to see that the breadth of that work. But I'm more excited today at it than I was at any time. And the reason I say that is because uh, Georgia has for the next few years, uh, this, from this year to last year, we have increased our support for world language and dual language immersion 70 fold. So that means that we have really incredible, taken an incredible leap forward. We were already doing a lot in Georgia, but I think over the next few years, you'll definitely see that we have really, are, are really going to ratchet up our support for language teachers, language programs, and for pathways to put more people who are uh, bilingual into um, into the support of the educational sector. So one of the things we do is uh, we've done with some of these um, as, as our initial deployments, we've started several professional learning communities across Georgia. Uh, really these are, we've launched these for Georgia educators, but we have not shut the door on anyone who wants to join these. So uh, educators in other states also can join these, but um, we've tried to create, uh, as far as I know, we're the only state in our union that has launched such a wide variety variety of these PLC communities this year. Teaching in the pandemic has been hard and difficult. And uh, it's increasingly important that we support our teachers. And that's what these programs are designed to do. And I always tell people they serve as our ears as well to listen to our teachers and gather their feedback. And um, what's exciting about these is they are delivered across five different languages. So the Japanese PLC is delivered in Japanese, the French, the German, the Spanish, and on. So we're excited about that. I think that has been a really successful, had a really successful start. We actually started these in November, December. So they just now getting underway, but by the end of this year, we will have held probably a hundred, a little bit short of a hundred different PLC meetings across these languages to support and listen and connect teachers to one another. So you can kind of see here in this graphic, a sort of outlay of that. So by the month, um, it is our intention to continue these moving forward in the years to come and continue expanding these. We also have these in dual language immersion because we know that dual language immersion is really, um, I always tell people, and this is something I firmly believe that language is a river. And by that, I mean that we can do anything. We can float any boat on that river. So we can teach math, we can teach science, we can teach about the world. We can do it all in multiple languages. So we need to get away from this um, it's really about expanding one's vision to include that content can be delivered in other languages. And it's not only effective, and I can say that for DLI, you know, in DLI, we deliver science and math in Spanish, French, German, Korean, Japanese, and on and on. And what we find is that students in kindergarten through fifth grade, or even sometimes in pre-K, uh, just the impactfulness of that kind of an education the only thing, frankly, that limits DLI, I think, is really just the availability of certified educators to support those programs. I think that it is in demand. We, uh, many of our DLI um, programs have waiting lists. 
Uh, we have grown from about, uh, since I've come on board, about 19 DLI programs to now 70. And I know that we are offering grants to start new DLI programs here in Georgia. So this is a growing uh, community for your language skills to be deployed. Um, and if just so you can put that into perspective, every time a DLI program starts, it starts typically in kindergarten and then next year goes up kindergarten, first grade, next year, kindergarten, first grade, third grade. So as we expand the number of these programs laterally, we are also every year expanding them vertically. So multiplier effect in terms of um, the actual need for people to be able to deliver this type of instruction. So huge need there. And like I said, uh, it's growing. Um, I think, and uh, it's really almost a separate discussion about certification in these different pathways and uh, probably something we could explore in a different um, context. But I will say that we have launched a new PLC, a couple of new PLCs, and that in the intent of those is to um, we're going to deliver those in Spanish and in English to encourage individuals who are seeking information on how to become a certified dual language immersion or world language teacher in Georgia. We're going to give them a community to connect with, and we're going to give them tools to build them toward that goal. It's something we, we desperately want to see. And I think in Georgia, we've really been very forward in terms of um, definitely for our region, very forward in trying to communicate outreach and get more um, individuals with these talents engaged in education across all sides of it. And this is an example of that um, new PLC we've started. And like I said, they just had their first meeting last Thursday, this past Thursday. And of course, the next meeting, I think will be entirely, it will be a Spanish version. So if you miss this and you can connect with the Spanish version of that later on, and there'll also be ones to come as well. Uh, in addition to all of this, we are really ratcheting up our creation of resources for teachers. And here's another area where languages and education talent are really becoming critical. So I would say that it's just, it's really just an incredibly opportunistic time for individuals who are multilingual to enter into education. Because of the growing nature of DLI, I've just explained the Georgia situation, but nationally over 3000 DLI programs are now underway and they continue to expand. And I feel like um, all of, in addition to that, um, the translation interpreta interpreting needs of schools is going to grow tremendously as well. Uh, even as a Department of Education, we um, don't have an internal in, uh, interpreting translation division, but we do contract with uh, individuals and with um, uh, communities to help with that interpretation and translation. One thing you'll find out there too is that that can vary. So it's really important to, I think, on the interpreting and translating side to really uh, establish those norms and things that help people to realize the quality of the interpreter or translator they're getting. Um, on the world language side, as I said here, you know, we're doing, we include ASL, we've got a lot of work there. So we're actually creating materials for these teachers. But on the dual language immersion side, what's interesting is we are taking science um, deliverables, lesson plans and other things, and then providing Spanish and French ger uh, and German versions of those. Uh, so it's important as we support our DLI teachers because they are teaching science and math concepts in Spanish, French, German, or whatever, they need materials in that language to support it. Right now, one of the challenges for our DLI teachers is they have to take the current things that are written in English and the English resources and then develop Spanish versions of that or French versions. So they really are doing a little bit double work as it were. Not only are they having to deliver the instruction entirely in the target language, but they're also having to develop materials that they'll use in the classroom. So it's our intent to bring them off of that role. I do apologize. My cat is also voicing his multilingual talents at this time, uh, which you might hear in the background. And I, I'm not very fluent in cat, but I think that he wants out. So we're going to get to him in a minute. But I did want to close with a few little things here, and that is just the grants we've launched here recently to support DLI programs, uh, rural 
programs. Um, we are, and one of the grants that I'm most um, happy about or that we've done is this cross-curricular grant. Again, I think we have to, we have to always tell people about taking language out of the box. And in school, it's sometimes I think people have relegated language to a class that they have. I had Spanish class, I had French class. But what they really need to understand, and I think that's the beauty of dual language immersion is language is more than a class. It is a, a delivery vehicle. I mean, it, we can do anything in any language. And I think we really need to under, expand our uh, understanding of what has value. Um, and that value, uh, I think people who are not involved in another language or haven't encountered it don't really understand sometimes the impact that language has. I always tell them, well, you know, you think about it, the fact that I can Google in German and understand a, a lot. So there's a lot of resources that I have direct access to because of that language capability. And just taking language out of the box, it's it, language is not, you know, it is a it is a course, but more than that, it is a vehicle of expression for communities, for culture. It is historical. Its depth is not defined by a sixty minute period. It is, um, it is across the, and it represents people. So I think people are really starting to open up their minds to the fact, and even acknowledging to some degree that hey, you know, we've been doing all this in English, you know, maybe we need to think about doing this in another language. I tell you what, of course, Home Depot figured that out. Of course, Apple did, and uh, the private sector figured that out on a very quick basis because money was behind it and sales were behind it. And I think on the education side, there's a little bit of a lag there, but I think that's coming along. And a lot of it has to do with capacity. You know, what can we I want to start 100 DLI programs tomorrow, but I would not be able to staff them. And that's not all the time because of the fact that we don't have individuals who are willing, but sometimes the certification pathways are, there are obstacles in those pathways that might keep people from achieving that. So we have to really continue to work to build um, more access for people into the uh, teaching profession um, to to use those skills. I mean, we have wonderful teachers from Puerto Rico, for example, but uh, they taught, you know, they're well PhDs, but they may not have English and that English is an impediment for them being, you, you know, deployed in, in a school setting here because of the, um, the obstacles that are in place uh, that they have to know English to a high degree, even though in a DLI program, they're really teaching in Spanish. They're not they have to interact, of course, in English. But I think what I'm trying to say is there's just a lot of more work to do to expand the gates to get more people into the educational profession. So that's a, a lot said. I hope you heard the uh, passion behind my voice when I tell these things. It's because of something that I've seen in person. I've seen just the wonderful effects of students being um, really immersed in their language. I always tell people DLI is a, is a uniting program. You know, it unites communities instead of um, it, it, it amplifies it. It's not, it's not a plus, it's a multipl multiplication sign because, and I think maybe that's, maybe that's the clearest picture of it is, it's not adding a language, it's multiplying not only your language, but your perspective, your, uh, sensitivity or understanding. I think it's really a huge um, cognitive benefit for students, for babies, for children, uh, for any individual. So if you are uh, listening to me today and, or my cat, then you know that um, these um, skills are really good and I want to encourage you to continue them. And I'll drop a few links in the chat for you guys too that you can look up on your own. But as I said, I'm always here to help and uh, share and talk and support however I'm able. All right, well, let me stop sharing. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. And I see we have a question in the chat. So we're going to um, save it for just a little bit. But thank you for um, sharing that information. Love the analogy of the river in languages. Beautiful. And the multiplication. I think we should change our Natiso logo to a multiplication sign. I mean, that is exactly how it is. So Love that, thank you for sharing that. All right, Lorena, you're next. 
Thank you so much. I was I was inspired. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, I am not going to share my screen. I really like to see your faces and, and hopefully um, today in the next few minutes, I am able to not only tell you a little bit about my journey, uh, but also um, just like my other colleagues did inspire you to, um, and I really like Patrick's analogy of taking language out of the box. If you are bilingual, I really hope that some of my stories inspire you to drive those skills um, to, to impact other people's lives. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about how I started. I, everything about my story is unconventional. <laughs> um, and I started, uh, this profession chose me because I started in high school, which I think um, some of Patrick's work really uh, impacts. And I'm one of those people. When I was in high school, I took French and I was really passionate about it, but I knew how to just say, hi, how are you? And have a basic conversation. As I was in high school, there was a deaf program um, in, in the same high school. So, uh, you know, there was a, a group of students, maybe less than 10. Uh, and I remember it because they were on the other side of the building and we would always see them in the cafeteria. And for my ninth and 10th grade year, I remember looking over to them signing. And I don't know if you've ever felt that way, but if anybody uses sign language, it's almost like immediately everything stops and, oh, that's so cool. And that was me. Um, and daily, I would just, you know, wave. And that's all I could do. And I remember going to home one day and thinking, I wish I could communicate with them. And that's when my life changed. That decision, that thought, that moment, I wish something I wish they could do something to communicate with me. And then I realized that I was using an external locus of control, that I was expecting them to come to me and do something for me. And then I realized, well, they can't. It's not like they can put on their ears and all of a sudden hear and communicate with me, but I can. I can learn their language. And so that's my first uh, you know, little dot of inspiration. Um, I think asking ourselves, uh, regardless of our age, whether you're in high school, in college, whether you already have a profession and you're just trying to figure out where to go next, is asking ourselves, what can I do that internal to impact someone's life? How can I use my skills? What can I possibly learn that can help other people? So at that time, I decided the next time I would go back to say hello, I wasn't just going to say hi, but I was actually going to look up um, something really difficult, H and I, you know, hi. <laughs> and so I started doing that to them, hi. And all I did was put that minuscule effort of just hi, and I had the entire um, group of students around me signing around me and telling me things and all of a sudden I wasn't sitting with my regular friends in the cafeteria but I was sitting with them and that also changed my life I was immersed um, like I said it chose me <laughs> unconventionally with their language as I started uh, evolving and you know going to 11th 12th grade uh, I was already conversationally fluent um, and then I realized in my circle of friends I had a deaf friend and I never realized that I never did anything about her. So of course, um, that is my other inspiration for you. Look around in your circles, because a lot of times there are people that we are acquainted with, we might know of, um, that we might be able to do something to impact their lives. And so that's what I did. I called my friend and said, hey, I'm fluent. I can talk to you now. And we met up and I asked her how she was doing. She's a little bit older than me. And she was telling me about how frustrated she was that she couldn't do simple things like go to the doctor and get um, and be able to have a conversation with her doctor openly. And I don't want to give you my age. I'm still young. ish, <laughs> uh, But this was about 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And so uh, she had a very difficult time uh, uh, with access to communication. Um, and so when I sat there again, I asked myself that question like, gosh, I wish you could just get an interpreter. <laughs> and she would look at me. Yeah, that would be nice. That would be nice. Interpreters are very few and far between. It's like, ah. Oh. And then, of course, I decided, OK, I'm going to help you. Um, at this time, I realized I need to do something to formalize my education. Who do I know? And so, of course, I you know, reached out. Um, there was a lot of interpreters around me that kind of took me under their wing um, and decided to point me in the right direction and how to formalize my skills and be able to um, interpret for my friend. 
eventually, as I started formalizing my skills and, um, you know, going to courses and attending, um, you know, these webinars that were opening my eyes, I realized that I ethically, I couldn't be her interpreter because of impartiality. So this is a little bit about interpreting, um, just like doctors uh, and like Romina beautifully explained, uh, we uh, abide by a codes of ethics and just like surgeons don't operate on their own family members, just to remain impartial, we also as interpreters do not or try to ensure that we don't uh, interpret for family members. So in this case, I um, continued my education and, and I had her in mind uh, the entire time. Um, my journey continued. I decided that the best way to learn at that time was not only theory, but also application. And as a trilingual interpreter, I always heard from everyone. I don't know if you are bilingual, you might um, find this uh, your case as well, which was, gosh, you're, you know, these languages is so valuable. But I didn't fully understand where that value was. Like, how do I how do I choose a profession where I can impact someone's life? Um, even then, as I was starting into the interpreting profession, it was still, there was still a lot of uh, the honeymoon phase with language where you start using it and you're like, oh, <laughs> this is nice. Um, so as I continued to try to figure out, I did a lot of traveling, um, specifically looking for different deaf, deaf programs and um, I heard some, you know, even some that were registered here were from Egypt. I traveled to Egypt, Israel, tried to go everywhere around the world that I could to meet or submerge myself into deaf communities so that I can fully understand culture. And that leads me to the next thing about interpreting. At times when we are learning a language and we're thinking about interpreting, we only think about those hard skills, the linguistic portion, um, terminology. And in my experience, um, terminology was the easiest thing for me in all of the languages that I know. The hardest thing for me was understanding culture, mediating culture, um, because culture is unique, right? There are some things that we call them the tip of the iceberg, you know, that everybody does in a community. But there are some other things that are affected by the experiences of the person. And so this is where uh, I feel like we have a unique perspective. Uh, we have the opportunity to learn about culture and to be able not to say, hey, I know exactly what's happening because as interpreters, we don't do that. But to be able to say, um, hey, I there might be something here that might need uh, communication or mediation in communication. Um, I can think of a ton of examples. There's words in Spanish that don't exist, exist in English. Uh, healthcare, I'm specifically a medical interpreter, so I know in healthcare, healthcare in the United States, the culture of healthcare is completely different than it is in Latin American countries. I'm originally from South America. Um, my family is still there in, in Bogota, in Colombia. And I, when I speak, I always think about that, like how we communicate is affected also by culture in the way things are done uh, on a regular basis. So um, that is my next thing is the beauty about being an interpreter is not only that you're going to um, be able to say one word in the other language and yay, because uh, that's cool. But the beautiful part is that you can use your skills to mediate language between two people. And the part about that that is so valuable is the fact that doing that saves lives. And I mean that. Uh, in medical interpreting, I'm gonna tell you a story in which I had to do that and it really changed my life. It really solidified my decision to be a trilingual interpreter and continue uh, developing as a trilingual interpreter. Um, I was in a session, it was specifically English and Spanish and I won't reveal any other names or anything just to maintain confidentiality. But to give you some context, um, the family was calling in really upset because hospice care was in, uh, in, in, in there, you know, there was a rep from hospice, hospice care. When the word hospice was being mentioned, um, even though they were, some were bilingual and understood, that's why they had not called an interpreter. For them, hospice was a place. Uh, in Spanish, we can say un asilo or, or a place where someone would go to die 
That's what they thought was happening. And in this case, hospice care in the United States is basically a service in which they want to discuss with you how to make the person comfortable. How, you know, is it, is it at home with a nurse? Is it what types of services can we have available to you? And that was the conversation that needed to happen. Um, so when they called me, all, both of them upset, nurse, hospice nurse trying to figure out uh, how to talk to them and them saying, no, we don't want it. And so the first question I asked was, you know, may I have a few seconds uh, just to introduce myself and ensure that I understand the context. And that's what I did. And we call this the pre-session or triage. Sometimes it's not possible, but in this case, it was crucial. When I took those few seconds and I asked, when you hear hospice, are you thinking of a place? Yes, we don't want him to go to a place. I realized, oh, okay, cultural mediation kicked in. And so I was able to tell the hospice nurse, they're under the impression that you're here to take him to a different place and they don't understand that it's a service. May I please explain or would you please explain? And in this case she did and they were able to get the situation taken care of. That was really life-changing for me because I realized that my job as an interpreter was saving or turning their life around. Had I not been there, their communication would have continued to um, be been frustrated because of their thought worlds or what they thought was being communicated. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is um, that the biggest uh, thing that the biggest failure in communication is the belief that it has happened. Um, and, and this is exactly the case. They, they were communicating, but they were not communicating. They were missing the context. So um, as I continued in my, in my journey as an interpreter, I also realized that I really needed to ensure that my skills were up to par because mind you, I became bilingual and started volunteer interpreting and filling in my education. So um, I was accepted in a fellowship uh, where another um, interpreter, mentor, uh, a American Sign Language interpreter supervised my work. Um, and this fellowship was through the Katie Center. And this was really life-changing for me um, because, it, you know, there's different ways to enter into the profession. And now it's a lot easier. I agree with Romina. Tons of bachelor's degree programs online because of the pandemic. A lot of programs have gone online and a lot of certificate programs. So if you've already completed your degree or you're trying to still decide what to do. There's tons of certificate programs that at least get you started into the profession. Um, and then I would suggest a fellowship, especially in ASL, because you need somebody to see you and supervise you. Um, in our work as sign language interpreters, we have a theory for decision making that I'd like to talk to you about. And if there's nothing else you remember from today, I, I would love for you to write this down. So uh, ethical decision making theory that we use is called DCS, demand control schema. And it is my mission as a trilingual being in the middle of spoken language and ASL to bring that over into spoken language so that we can use it a lot more. Demand control is something that uh, isn't a theory for decision making. It's like a framework that helps us verbalize the demands of our work and to be able to identify the controls. And I find that this is probably the most difficult thing for interpreters after learning the language is the big question, well, what do I do if? I have tons of bilingual interpreter friends that say, I can learn the language, but I don't, I don't feel competent. I don't know what I'm doing if this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens. Um, and even some that have gone through college, they still kind of feel that sense of inadequacy as if, you know, you're only going to learn it if you start the job. And, and I don't agree with that. I think demand control is, is a great theory for decision making that you can apply even in your own life. I apply it all the time. Um, but it's one that can help you to verbalize what exactly am I facing in this particular moment in my work and what can I do within the boundaries of my profession? And if we think about it, um, there's tons of other practice professions that have um, this ethical decision-making process, such as doctors. They're not taught everything they need to know. There's a ton of you know, ethics programs that they have to go through. Um, our, our profession is not technical, it's practice because we work with people. And that's really what draws us to this profession is to be able to 
um, impact someone's life. Um, so if you didn't get that, so it's DCS, Demand Control Schema. The author is Robin Dean or Dr. Robin Dean. Um, she is amazing. A lot of the work, or a lot of the things that you'll find on this theory for decision of decision making are for ASL interpreters, but she's also starting to appear in a lot of spoken language um, uh, webinars and things. So you might have already heard of her. And if you have, yay, continue to <laughs> explore that. Um, but DCS also changed my life because I was able to um, really take a look at my work as a trilingual interpreter. Um, I worked a few years as a VRS interpreter. So VRS stands for Video Relay Service. Um, this is a service that is available to uh, the deaf and hard of hearing community in the United States where they can set up a phone and it goes through an interpreter first and that interpreter calls whoever or wherever they'd like. It's just equal access to communication. Working there really helped me because it helped me to really level up my skills in both Spanish and English and, you know, being able to look at someone who is speaking in Spanish and sign it into ASL. So actually using simultaneous languages at the same time. The most fun I've ever had is doing that back and forth. And so if you've ever thought that ASL was cool, uh, I'm here to tell you that ASL saves lives. It is, <laughs> that is my opinion. And there's a deeper impact that you can make in the community because not only will you be able to provide access to communication for, for spoken language community, but also de deaf community. Um, and it's, it's amazing. And the deaf community um, is a community that will embrace you with arms open. Um, I still, my friends that I had when I was in high school, um, some of them unfortunately have died, but they were with me for my entire journey. I'm almost 40 and they're still around with me and they're still really supportive. Um, now, as I, in the past five, the past 10 years, I would say, I realized the impact that I can make in others. And so I've been working at this wonderful company where I'm given the opportunity to um, develop other professionals that are not only in the US, but also in Latin America. Um, a lot of mentoring and a lot of, um, uh, ethical introspection case consultation in which we take a scenario and we kind of figure out 10 ways to look at it. <laughs> There's a saying in, in our profession that, you know, it, it takes about 10 interpreters to change a light bulb, you know, one to actually change it and 10 to give you their perspective <laughs> on how it should be done. Um, and and I, I, sometimes that sounds a little bit like, really, you can't agree on something, but it's not that. It's just that the fact that we understand that there's tons of ways that you can deal with a certain situation um, and all of them might be okay um, just with different consequences so uh, I, I don't know I want to make sure that I'm within the time <laughs> Um, so overall, uh, I hope that this was helpful to you. Uh, I, I hope that I inspire you to really drive the skills. If you're already bilingual, please, please know that you have the opportunity to change someone's life, change the course of their life, save their life. I do mean that I'm not being cocky. <laughs> um, and also uh, be able to, as much as you give, is as much as we get. Uh, and I, I, I truly believe that the more you impact someone's life, the more you stop asking yourself that question of what should I do next? More of, I should do more of this. Um, so I hope this was helpful to you. Thank you, Anna, for the opportunity. And I really appreciate Rumina and Patrick's perspectives as well. Gosh, thank you so much, Lorena. It, it is so hard to follow all of these wonderful speakers. I have learned so much from each of you, but you know, it, it is just inspiring. And you know, one thing that you said, Lorena, just just hit me because you mentioned, you know, this profession chooses you, um, and it is totally how it happens. You know, none of us are born interpreters. You know, some of us just grew up in an environment where we were asked to interpret at age, you know, fourteen right? It was just automatic. Um, and so I want to share a little bit of, of my story, but I really appreciate how, you know, uh, I'm glad I'm the last one because I get to kind of put all these pieces together. And it's just amazing how the puzzle comes together. And I'm hoping those of you who are here today, especially we have some bilingual high school students, and I'm, I'm hoping that you're inspired to really use the power of my multilingualism and you can see how many doors are open for you, right? Those of you who are 
you know, working on a second language, a third language, you know, lots of doors that can be open for you. So I'm hoping that we're able to inspire you and, you know, perhaps not as interpreters, perhaps not as the translators, but my goodness, teachers, um, ASL instructors, I mean, there's so many opportunities. So, you know, the river is yours, like Patrick said, and you get to build whatever you want with it, right? Um, but again, I came from uh, Colombia speaking absolutely no English. Um, so that was my first culture shock. I lived in New York, uh, we were, let's see, I was 14 when I came. And automatically about two months later, I was the interpreter for the family, not knowing, you know, knowing a, a very little English, but I was doing, you know, medical appointments, whatever the neighbor needed, I was there. Um, so basically it was just by default that, that I was expected to be an interpreter. But now looking back, and I'm not as, you know, uh, I'm not gonna tell my age as brave Lorena did, but, you know, looking back all of those experiences that you have when you're that young, really empower you and really lead your path. You may not know it when you first have them. Of course, I had no idea that I was going to end up where I am, you know, at 14. But looking back, it was just like, okay, that was meant to happen. Uh, because it really opened my eyes to, you know, language access, language justice issues. I, you know, had no idea that some people just could not get access to healthcare, to education because of their language skills. And that really, at that age, really opened my mind. Um, I started as a medical interpreter, so my background is in social work, and I started working for um, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, which is a large organization here. Um, my job was to build the, uh, you know, interpreting department, which it was just me for all of the hospitals, so I got, you know, pretty fast training um, in everything medical never formal training, just on the job training. So it was just, you know, I had the knowledge, but then later on I was able to have the structure and, and say, okay, now I need to do this a little bit better. Um, but it really helped me understand, you know, medical terminology and the protocols and really working with uh, physicians to help them understand the cultural side. So I love that, you know, uh, Romina and, and Lorena, you mentioned the culture piece because a lot of what we do as interpreters it's not just a language exchange, right? We're building cultural bridges. Um, and so it, it really was um, beautiful to be able to do that and, and help folks understand each other, um, not just through the language, but also you know, really talking about their culture and cultural differences. So I worked as a medical interpreter, loved it, absolutely loved it, mostly in the emergency room. And I know it sounds very crazy, but I really love the environment and the, you know, just the adrenaline and everything just moving so fast. Um, Eventually, life took me to um, the school district, one of the largest, actually the largest school district here in the state of Georgia, where also I, I started as an interpreter, but the switch from medical to education made me realize how unprepared I was. Um, I knew how to mechanically interpret. I was very comfortable with medical terminology, came to the schools and I was lost. Um, and so my mission became, okay, if I have trouble with this, I'm sure other people have trouble with this, let's figure out what, what training is lacking and what I can do about it. And I really love that a couple of you mentioned, you know, we know we have problems, we know we, there are issues, but let's figure out what I can do to fix them, right? And so that was the mentality I had and, and started, you know, working towards improving my terminology and education, which was which is a big mountain. So those of you who are just starting as interpreters, you know, definitely try to dive into the vocabulary of the setting that you're working in. Um, so an interpreter in the legal setting, they have their own lingo, they have their own abbreviations. Um, their own, the, the protocols are, are fairly similar. I cannot speak about ASL. Um, interpreter or sign language interpreters, but you know we have the same kind of protocols in, in education. There might be a little bit of a slight difference in our code of ethics, but in terms of you know the interpretation mechanics and, and how to do that, it's pretty much the same. Vocabulary, not so much, right? So if you're thinking about working in a school, make sure that you get familiarized with the vocabulary of that district. Sometimes um, terminology will vary from one district to another. They all have their own little lingo. They all have their own little, um, you know, abbreviations. So it is important to get really familiarized with that. An easy way to do that is visit their website. You know, dive in there, figure out. Especially if you're working as a freelance interpreter and you work for many different school districts, you know, dive in there and get to know the lingo before you start interpreting. That will help a lot. 
Um, your Department of Education has amazing resources, I'm sure in every state. Of course, Georgia has probably the best, thanks to Patrick, but lots of great resources that are oftentimes translated into many different languages. Of course, the bulk of it is in Spanish. So for those of you who speak Spanish, we're very lucky that we have a lot of resources. But I'm seeing a lot of um, uh, departments of education kind of building up their you know, multilingual resources, which is great. Arkansas is a great example. I mean, they have a huge Marshallese population. And so they're trying to build a lot of information in that specific language. So it's really encouraging that, you know, finally we're being seen, right? And, and, and our resources are being highlighted in different uh, departments of education. So terminology is definitely there. Um, language proficiency. So, you know, it sounds pretty, you know, simple and straightforward, but you need to make sure that you have both languages very strong or the languages that you're going to be working on. Um, so language usually in the school districts, um, we're, one of the things that we're pushing for is to make sure that anybody who works as an interpreter has some verified language proficiency test in place, which, you know, sounds like really you do not ask for one, but sometimes that happens. You know, anybody that is bilingual does not mean that you can interpret. And so make sure that you have a language proficiency test in place. Uh, there are so many different avenues to be able to do that, but you want to demonstrate that you have both languages equally, you know, fresh in your brain and that you can switch from one another. Um, and to do that, you need to have somebody else verify that for you. We know you're bilingual, but we need somebody else to verify it for you. Um, I will definitely recommend that you study the code of ethics from different professions. Of course, you know, we have a lot of similarities, but there might be some slight differences in legal, for example, you know, totally different story than it is in schools. But, you know, if, if there's one area that kind of sparks your interest, just go. There's so many different organizations, professional organizations that will provide you guidance um, in terms of the code of ethics. But mentoring is also very important. You know, attending you know events like this one, and there's so many out there, especially because of the pandemic. One of the you know benefits is that there's so many things online. Um, so definitely find a mentor. You know, ask them questions. Do a little informal interview. How did you get started? What do I do here? This is where I am. You know, how do I get better? Um, one thing that really helped me as I was switching from medical to educational interpreting is to again to to practice that vocabulary. I would use things like TED Talks because number one, they're super interesting. Number two, I love how the speakers usually try to enunciate the words really well. And so I would use them to practice my interpretation, my consecutive interpretation. It's free, it's there. And I would um, record myself, you know, interpreting consecutively or simultaneously. Um, or sometimes I would, you know, try to practice my site translation skills by using the subtitles. So something very easy that you can do, you know, again, it's free and it's usually, you know, topics that are interesting. Um, so it's not as, you know, as boring as practicing with, with other academic, you know, things, you know, you can, you can really learn a lot of the vocabulary out there. Um, working on idioms, super important. Idioms are in every single field and they always give us such a hard time because idioms are incredibly culturally bound. Um, and so I know in Spanish we have thousand of idioms that make absolutely no sense. Of course, in English, we have so many more. I just had a, a student tell me yesterday um, that she was talking to a Spanish, um, uh, no, a special education teacher who was uh, saying, you know, we're going to move your child to a classroom, but we're not going to throw your, your child into the wolves. And she said, oh my gosh, I cannot interpret this information literally because that's an idiom that makes absolutely no sense in Spanish and mom is just going to run away, right? So throwing somebody into the wolves is just, you know, letting them just fend, fend for themselves, basically. Um, so studying idioms and trying to figure out how to interpret them in your language will really help because that's a, that's a challenge, again, because we don't have a lot of equivalents from one language to the other but it really teaches you about language um, and it really teaches you how, how to manipulate language to make it understandable for somebody else. I had a, another student who said, you know, um, she was, she's actually one of my best interpreters, but when she came to the United States, she spoke no English. And so her child started kindergarten and she was still working on, on her English skills. And she said, you know, the first flyer I got from my kindergarten teacher 
um, said, you know, please bring finger foods to your child's classroom. And she was just horrified. Like she had no idea what finger foods are and these are just, you know, small snacks. But just things like that, that just, you know, we, we as educators may not realize that we're saying that to all of our families without knowing that, you know, we just don't have that type of, uh, of terminology in our setting. So um, definitely studying uh, idioms is really important. Accessing uh, resources, TED Talks, absolutely love them because I get to learn a lot and I get to practice. Nobody's watching me and I listen to my own recording. The reason I record myself is so that I can see progress. Um, because then I can hear the first, you know, recording I, I, I made and I think, oh my goodness, I missed a whole bunch of information. Nobody's watching me, right? And then you can kind of um, check yourself uh, throughout. Um, one of the passions that I have is for special education. And one of the reasons I started my, my doctoral degree was because of my experience as an interpreter. And Lorena, you mentioned something really important about, you know, culture and how sometimes some terms can be scary for families, you know, in, in our setting, special education is one of those terms, right? When we talk about, you know, in education, you have a child who may have um, some difficulties learning or there's something going on and we go in as interpreters and say, you know, your child is going to be placed in special education. Um, the reason that our families are terrified of that term is because, again, just as what you were ex explaining, uh, Lorena, the term hospice, for us, special education means I'm going to take your child and put him in an institution and that's it, right? Because in many of our countries, that's what special education is. And so we have to have a lot of you know, tact and really be careful with our language, not to ch change or not to be inaccurate, but to be sensitive in the way that we talk to parents about something like special education, because that could lead to a lot of miscommunication. And sometimes, you know, it's happened that parents feel so strongly about special education that they decide, you know, I don't want this for my child. And then the child is affected, right? And so as interpreters, you know, we do so much of this bridging of, of culturals and, you know, cultures and languages that is just constant and amazing. So it is an, a very rewarding work. Um, some of my most rewarding experiences is seeing you know, children that I saw at the hospital when I was an interpreter and then see them graduate and still me being the interpreter when they graduated from high school. And I thought, oh, that's, that's super cool. Um, so when you see those experiences and you see the, the ability to impact not only the children, but the parents and the educators, because you're working with a, within a community is just amazing. And I, I cannot imagine doing anything different. So, um, but access resources, uh, ask people, don't be afraid to just send an email and say, okay, tell me about this. Um, I think interpreters were very, uh, yeah, it, sometimes they be competitive, but I think we like the mentoring, right? We like to see somebody that says, hey, you know, I speak French and I want to be an interpreter. Okay, let me tell you how to get there. Um, so feel free to just, you know, ask questions and reach out. And, you know, we will definitely do what we can to guide you. So, so that is the, the end of my presentation, very informal, but I wanted to really, again, share my story and really tell you how I got here. Um, and, you know, why this organization exists and why we do this is because, you know, we're all passionate about what we do. And I think you can see that from our presentation. So, um, so it's goodness, timing is just perfect. So I do want to open it for um, questions. I know I've seen a lot of questions on the chat, but I just wanted to, um, you know, again, encourage you to unmute yourself if that makes you comfortable or um, Dr. Pendergrass is here to help us moderate the questions. So. We have um, three people who are ready to unmute, but as they're asking questions and our panelists are talking, um, feel free to add additional questions or be prepared to unmute when these three finish. Uh, so first is Jocelyn. She asked a question about those DLI PLCs when Patrick Wallace was talking. And I saw, Patrick, that you put some information in the chat box, but she has a follow-up question. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you all for such great presentations. I've learned a lot today. I'm a dual language teacher in North Carolina and very interested in um, participating in those PLCs. And I see that you put in the chat, um, Mr. Wallace, that we can participate, especially regarding to what you were saying about um, dual, uh, dual language teachers uh, have to translate everything for science and social studies. 
Yes, that is a big thing for us. So I am very interested in that. And eventually, then this is something for the rest of you. Um, I am very interested in becoming an educational interpreter. So this has been awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just respond and say those PLCs, um, we, I always have the idea that I don't ever want to um, close anything I'm doing unless the government tells me I have to, basically. So they are accessible and we've made them completely open and we invite any teachers to join us. So it's just, a, it's we built it for Georgia teachers, but honestly, if I'm being honest, I would say I built it for the community. So you're a part of that community no matter where you live. And um, yeah, I mean, I think it's just a, um, I, I think also when we get done developing those DLI resources in science and eventually math, they will be available to you in North Carolina. I will give a shout out to North Carolina. They have, I think, close to 200 DLI programs there. They have a fantastic state coordinator as well. Um, but yeah, North Carolina, definitely. Uh, North is in your name. So sometimes I have a problem saying you're from the South. But because uh, I would say then it's easier for me to make the statement. Yeah, Georgia, we're leading the Southeast. But if I include North Carolina, it's neck and neck. Honestly, North Carolina is really good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so uh, next we have uh, Malik with a question about getting started with interpreting. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Hi, hi, yes. hi everyone. Um, my name is Malik Kamara from um, Guinea, West Africa, the country close to near Liberia, Sierra Leone, um, from French speaking country. So, I've been interested in becoming an interpre uh, interpreter, French. Um, I've worked uh, for the US Army as a cultural advisor and um, also a training, uh, super, uh, a training support specialist. Um, help them get ready for the West African country in case they deploy them. So basically how to behave, what to do, what not to do. Because sometimes we take things for granted in this country and different countries, they don't mess around. So, um, but I did that and I want to go bigger. Basically, I like helping people. You know, I like, I'm good with people. And um, it's something that I really want to do for Korea. Um, but I don't know how to get into it. You know, where to start. Um, that's why I'm here right now. My mom saw this. Um, she sent me the link. She's like, maybe this is something that you might want to look into, you know, try to participate in the meeting and see what it is. If you like it, then why not? And it sounded interesting for me to, now I'm here and thank you to all those speakers that, you know, teach us something here. Um, very interesting and I want to do this. It's something that I want to do, but I need help how to get into it. Yes. So I think we can open this up to any panelists. Do you have any advice for him? I do, if I may. Um, Malik, that is so exciting. I, I actually, I'm learning Swahili because I support the Congolese community in my area. And I constantly tell them how incredible they are because they speak so many tribal languages and they can use those languages to help others uh, right. interpret for them. So I'm excited to hear about you wanting to do the same. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say you first would have to decide which area or which community you would like to use your skills in. Um, so decide whether that is community, uh, in the community and then what type. Um, in ASL Interpreter, we have what is called a generalist. Um, so we get trained up to a certain level that we can work in any communities and then you specialize in either medical, legal, educational. Um, in spoken language interpreter interpreting, I feel like it's a little bit backwards. Um, we start specializing first. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you kind of do have to decide if you want to do medical interpreting, legal interpreting, or educational. Once you kind of know which area or you have an idea of which area, then you there are specific uh, organizations that can help you. 
this one being one of them for educational interpreting, they can guide the way. There's two other organizations that can lead you for medical interpreting, which is the CCHI, the IMIA, they're both national. And on their websites, they have different um, uh, schools that has the basics of like, what is the theory? What is the basics of being an interpreter? A lot of these programs are 40 hours to 120 hours that are completed over a period of six months to a year. And that mm -hmm. is like the basics of being an interpreter. Now you've already done some work. So a lot of this information is most of the time, like finding the differences, like, oh, this is different. Oh, this is what I did here for the military, this is different because you are gonna find some differences there. Um, right. Once you complete that, then you the those organizations tell you what the other steps are, which is how to get the supervised work experience um, and then how to fly on your own by working as a either on the phone interpreter, BRI these days is, you know, because of COVID is everywhere. And then also community interpreting like Romina. So that, that would be, I know it sounds like a lot, but it, you're really, <laughs> you're there, you're kind of like me, you're unconventional. There are situations that kind of pulled you into the profession. So I would encourage you to keep looking to see which area you want to use your skills in and then go from there. <laughs> um, so don't stop. <laughs> I'm definitely not gonna stop. Um, like I said, thank you. I mean, again, thank you so much. It's something that I wanna do. I like helping people, you know, um, like meeting new people, learning new cultures, which is my favorite. I travel a lot in national. I just got back from Austria. I play soccer also. So I was in Austria playing soccer and I uh, just got back two months ago. But uh, now I really want to pursue this career, you know, just stay still in one place and do something. And I have to go around all over the place and, you know, just have a career, do something. So um but yeah thank you so much i will try to look into something more i do some more research you know on how to get into it absolutely Malik. I'm, I'm so so amazed and this is the reason we wanted to do this because there's so many people like you um that just needed you know some some guidance and you know of course we can't give you all the answers here but right. we're here as your resource you know we're, we're here because we also started like you this is okay i want to do something and i want to help you know <laughs> because i have no idea where to start so yes you know lot, lots of help out there um i think it's a, it's a great idea to to pick the area of interest and, and there's so many different organizations, there are different paths for certification, specifically for legal, for medical, we're working on a path for educational. So there are different requirements for each. And, you know, sometimes it does take, you know, a 40 hour course, but of course, uh, like Lorena was saying, having that fellowship, that practice after is amazing. Um, and, yeah. You know, volunteering, if you're able to volunteer in a school, for example, um, sometimes they will have specific requirements, hopefully they will have specific requirements for volunteers, but they would love to have you volunteer for parent teacher conferences, for example, which are super, you know, basic, there's no special education, high level vocabulary, um, and, and you can get the feel for what it's like to impact a family, number one, and to really help with your language. Um, and also, in, I'm sure in, in hospitals, there are different types of volunteer opportunities that may help uh, just to give you a chance to say, okay, is this really what I like? I had an interpreter tell me, you know, I would love to work in a hospital, but I hate blood. So I'm like, okay, yeah. you're going to have to figure this one out, right? And there's some things that you can only do once you're in that setting. So, All right. And I know the question is, is um, how long, like, let's say I start next semester or something. How long you think it will take me to actually get into a professional level of translating? That's the question. Like how long? Like uh, two years or three years? I don't know. Just, just want to know if anybody can answer that, or, mm -hmm. or it just depends on uh, the field. I would say, and I'm sorry, if any of the panelists want to answer that. Excuse me. Um, hi, oh. Malik. This is Romina. I really like what my colleagues Anna and Lorena mentioned because I can speak from a medical interpreter perspective here in Southern California. Um, and I did, uh, I, 
I started taking courses on focusing on the medical branch and I really loved it from, from the beginning. Um, so what helped me was volunteering for two solid years. And by volunteering for those two years, that's when I started applying to language agencies and they were like, oh, okay, you have at least two years of experience. So they take me in and you get to negotiate your rates, how much you want to get paid. And you okay. get covered. Yeah, so um, at least what I see on, on websites, on the internet, some agencies want at least one year of experience in, in with medical interpreting as a, as a niche. So to be honest, uh, it's a great question and it really depends on the field, I would say. Because hearing you talking about your medical interpreter earlier, it got my attention. Like this is something very interesting. I want to do this because like I said, I like helping people. Yeah, you know, of course. And I'm not you know, afraid of being around sick people or anything. It's just we all human being, and that's something that I would love to do to help other people. And you know, you know? Monique, there are colleagues that live abroad. I know somebody who lives in the Dominican Republic who has national certifications here in the United States, and they flew mm -hmm. out to take the examinations here. Um, you might want to look into that option too. Um, and uh, I know that Anna will send an email to everybody sharing the resources. So you can have all of those websites um, and, and uh, look into the requirements in more in depth, more in detail. I don't wanna bore you with all of it right now, but uh, yeah, there's definitely that option where you can find remote work. You're mentioning that you would like to um, be stable in one place. For right. me, I love going all over because I have a kind of <laughs> personality where I like to go here. I like to go there to that hospital, to that clinic, to that hospice. I love that. That gives me energy. So I do, right. that, in, I do that in my city. But I know friends and colleagues who like to work from home and be in the computer all day. And that's how they provide that language access service. So there is that opportunity in the medical field, Malik, for you out there. I'm just going to yes, jump on. Um, oh, sorry, Malik. I just wanted to quickly say, too, that I know you didn't say being a teacher, and maybe that's not where you want to go. But I was also thinking about the fact I mentioned in the chat there are 45 states now with seals of biliteracy. So I want you to imagine that there are testers testing students on their spoken ability in all these different languages. Last year, over a million students nationwide got tested. So there's a growing industry of people who actually also test students on their ability to speak languages. So it's just another opportunity for people with language, but anyway. Right. I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. Um, and stay in touch, uh, Malik, you know, where we'll give you our contact information. We'll connect you. This is a reason why we do this, because when we find somebody that really wants to do this, I promise you we're going to connect you with the right person. So, so definitely. And you got my touch. email. Right? I have your email. I know where to find you. Thank you. Just uh, let them know to email me with the information and resources to put me with the right people. Perfect. I need we to do, do that. I need to do something. Thank you so much. I appreciate Perfect. it. You're very and thank welcome. you, everybody. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Okay, next is Gracia. Okay. Sorry, I think we missed the, the name, uh, Jennifer. Gracia. Sorry, Gracia, Hello. go ahead. Go ahead with your question. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Um, I had a question for, let me see, hold on, I think. I hope my mic, is my mic on? Everybody hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, I had a question for Lorena. Um, I think she she gave me an answer of, uh, <clears throat> uh, she gave me a, a website about um, some courses for an ASL, for ASL interpreting. Um, I, uh, I, I, I'm kind of, I'm fluent in ASL, but not like in anything professional. I learned it um, through uh, like my church. I really do dove into it for several years and I interpreted for uh, just community stuff, but, um, but I don't have any formal training in it or, or certification. I just had questions on, um, uh, I think now I've looked over the RID website before. I think they require you to have like a bachelor's and I just, 
was wondering if there was any specific programs um, that you recommended or any other pathways or um, yeah. any other information you could provide on on the ASL specifically because because I have that skill I just don't have anything to, to formalize it yeah that's great so that means that you can skip some of the language courses so the first recommendation I have is uh, that you um, select a school so for ASL interpreting um, Nowadays, there are some wonderful two-year programs um, that can get you where you need to be. Um, so those programs will actually uh, first see what level of ASL you have, and then mm -hmm. they you can skip some of the initial courses. So that's nice. Um, you can get started okay. on that. Um, the, those programs, some of them are online. I know of a university, oh gosh, it's the last, it's, I think Woods, um, there's one mm -hmm. in Alabama that has a, a also, I think Troy University has an ASL program online as well. But you can also check with your local colleges to see if there's an interpreter training track for ASL. Um, mm -hmm. They'll place you with your language skills so you can skip those courses. And then you just start taking the courses. A lot of times, once you already know, you just take them in ASL, um, which is really sounds challenging, but it's really fun because sometimes yeah. you get to work with deaf professors. So That's you awesome. go from there. Yeah, you do the two years, which kind of gets you to where you need to be like interpreting, voicing and all of that good stuff. And then uh, from there, the, the second two years, you can either complete it in the same program, just do some of your prereqs and all of that. Or I know a lot of my colleagues have like a degree in psychology, deaf studies, you know, other areas, but they also have that minor in interpreting. Once you okay. have that, then you can get certified. There's ways that you can also do a lot of volunteer work. Um, that's mm -hmm. what I did. Uh, and I told them I was a student, like I was still learning. Um, yeah. I did my fellowship through the Katie Center um, uh, 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 St. Catherine University, and they mm -hmm. did theirs through Gallaudet University, which now you can work with directly. Gallaudet University is the only university or one, yeah, really the only one that is all ASL students or, yeah. or deaf students in here. And so I know mm -hmm. you're probably familiar. Look at Gallaudet um, EDU and see because they have some wonderful certificate training programs um, if you already know ASL and you would be learning from uh, deaf professors, which should yeah. be treat so yeah, yeah i understand, understand. Okay, okay thank, thank you, you so much. much you're welcome that is pretty interesting to be able to learn from um deaf and hard of hearing professors straight so that's pretty neat i'm gonna highlight um uh, uh, grecia for just a second and i saw janelle your uh, your question but grecia is an incredibly talented human being she's actually one of my former students and if you visit our youtube channel and see all of the videos that we have. That is Gracie. You know, she's she's just amazing and works so well with different cultures and languages. So we're really grateful for her. Um, so glad glad that you're here, Janelle. You're you're mentioning something very important, and it's um, the American Translators Association, the ATA certification, which is for translators. I was going to put this um, question on the chat, if you know the difference between a translator and an interpreter, because that is very, very important. Um, so an interpreter, we've, we've been talking mostly about interpretation, which is oral exchange of um, ideas and, you know, from one language to the other. Translation has to do with actual written documents to different skills. Um, to different sets of you know, knowledge. So it's important to acknowledge what, what you have, whether you're strong in verbal skills, that's great. But you know, some interpreters are not strong in the written language, right? Because for whatever reason, they learn how to speak the language, but they're not able to translate it um, into documents. So it is important to number one, acknowledge you know, the skills that you have and, and work on the, on the skills that you want to improve. Um, but ATA certification, they do provide, um, from what I understand, and this, uh, this, uh, my fellow speakers, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they do provide a generalized um, certification for translators. So it's not specific to a field, um, which is, you know, it's great if you're working for many, you know, literally, trans literal, literally translation for, for books, you know, translation of books. Um, but they're, you know, they, you could provide, um, they do provide the certification so that you can start working on those translations, but you may not be prepared to work in, you know, translations in the medical field, 
um, because that language is not there. So, you know, they do provide the generalized um, kind of certification, but it is still important to get additional training in the field that is specific um, that you work on, whether it's medical or legal or education. Um, so in, in our setting in education, most of the time there's no requirement for you to be ATA certified. Um, I don't know about medical and, and legal, whether they require translators to be certified. It's, it's recommended, but it's not a requirement. So um, I hope that answers your question. But if uh, Romina, Lorena, and, and Patrick want to add anything. I don't know much about the ATA because indeed I solely at the moment work as an interpreter and I do have the um, CCHI, which is known as the Certification Commission for Healthcare Interpreters certification. So, uh, and, and they, CCHI, do not require for me to be ATA certified because again, um, it would be um, Britain translation work, which I'm not doing at the moment. So I, I don't have much information about uh, the ATA, unfortunately. But I do know that the ATA has different divisions and there are different um, committees as well. So that's that's all I can say on my end as a medical interpreter. Perfect. Well, any other questions then? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Hi. Hi, well, I just wanted to mention, first of all, thank you for providing this um, this webinar really um, to help us all learn more. Um, the reason why I was asking is because when I first embarked on the journey of becoming an, um, an interpreter and translator for my school, uh, for my school district, I started um, doing it part time and then eventually transitioned into a field um, of communications because that's what my degree is. And so I was just planning to add more to my resume really and just more a bit more formalized training on it. Um, I took your courses, Anna, um, with the University of Georgia, and that's essentially, you know, what. I, what I have to kind of show, hey, you know, I'm actually looking more into this. And so I was just thinking about the different resources and other, you know, certifications available to demonstrate the skill and proficiency in certain areas. Um, I'm mainly asking because um, as I transition into my new position, I practically translate all of the letters into Spanish, um, all of the communication that is sent out to families. And so I just wanted to add something to that. Yeah, Janelle, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that you're here. But um, I think, you know, one of the issues that we have, I don't know that it happens a lot in medical and legal, but in education, um, one of the, the concerns that we have is that there's, there's still lack of knowledge and um, understanding of, of the job of the interpreter and translator. So when you're hired in a school as an interpreter, you know, they automatically assume that you can translate documents, no training, no nothing, just go ahead and translate. Um, and so, you know, we're still using Google Translate, which, you know, it's there. And as, as many of you know, it's not the, the, the best resource that we have. It is a resource and it is flexible. Um, but, you know, the assumption is there that your skills as an interpreter kind of transfer in the translation. And so Natiso is working on that as well because we're very, aware that, that that's happening. Um, and we wanna make sure that as we create the certification test for interpreters, that we also keep translators in mind. Because again, there's not a specific certification for, in our example, educational translators. Even though we, we have the responsibility to translate pretty high stakes documents, such as special education documents, we're, we're expected to do that with no training. Um, and so that's one of the other reasons that our organization was born so that we can make sure that that doesn't happen. Because again, you know, what I tell, I'm sure uh, Janelle, you've heard this before in my class, you, you know, the information that you share as an interpreter and translator is your responsibility. And so by creating a certification process, we're protecting you to make sure that you share the best information possible, but also the most accurate information as well. Um, so. Long answer to tell you, Jenny, we're working on that because we're very, very aware that that's, that's something that is definitely needed, so. Yeah, let me jump and, on that, Anna, and just add also, I'm sorry, I was just gonna say quickly that it's so important, really. Um, we, I think uh, our, a lot of our systems, they, well, this lack of, um, it just really needs to coalesce more. Um, and that's why the work that Anna is doing in this organiza organization is so important because we need to sort of baseline some of these 
um, roles that people are being placed in with no real training. And I think that's why on the education side, looking from what I know, and that's why I appreciate Anna's effort so much, I've learned to appreciate that effort, is we really need on the business side of being an interpreter and translator, those certifications set up. Um, because when we look at it, the educational side, I mean, there's, I think there's definitely a lot of work. And I, what I find is often the case sometimes is, uh, you know, Spanish teachers are pulled into these situations without training, you know, trying to navigate uh, communications. And, and it seems like a, per, per, uh, a perfectly, you know, normal thing. They have a need, they're trying to fill it with whatever um, resources they have at hand, but we really need to develop more standardization of these certifications, especially in the educational context. And so I just wanted to piggyback on what Anna's saying and how much, again, I appreciate the work. It's not a work that we can do on the education side in many ways. I think it has to be done through the, the profession side and for us then to, but it, it is a communication should be a work that's collaborative. And I also appreciate you, Janelle, in that role, because I know that it's increasingly important, like I said, for our districts and schools, and not only in Georgia, but around the USA to develop more um, standards and uh, sort of, I don't wanna say regularization, but you know, a standardization of what the minimums we expect for people who are asked to perform these roles in school settings. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we greatly appreciate your support as well. I'm sorry, Romina, go ahead. Oh, no, yeah, no, uh, the, all of this conversation just made me have a thought. And um, I, I often get, uh, get asked by language agencies um, as a medical interpreter if I can translate medical documents. And I think that's when, uh, when, when you show your ethics and your professionalism by putting that boundary and saying, no, you know, I focus on interpreting, which is verbal, and that's my forte. Unfortunately, I cannot offer that translation services for tomorrow or the day after tomorrow for like 10 medical history documents, you know? So it, the, yeah, I do myself, I honor my job and I'm like, um, yeah, unfortunately I cannot do it, you know? Um, it's, it's good to have that boundary, that limit and, uh, and just be ethical and say no. That's, that's the thought I had. That's an ex excellent point. And, and, you know, it brings back the idea of the importance of, you know, knowing your code of ethics, like Lorena was saying, and really getting to know this profession from the bottom up. So I greatly appreciate that. So I have four more minutes with you. I, I'm so, so thankful for your questions, for your engagement. Um, really appreciate the fact that, you know, this is our first event, but not our last one. Obviously, I think we, we have a passion for continuing these conversations and we want them to be you know, like this, just informal, sharing your stories, asking us questions about, you know, what, what do I need to do next? Um, because I really truly believe that, you know, we need to help each other um, and then we cannot work in bubbles uh, because nothing will move like that, right? Um, and so I, I really appreciate everybody's uh, participation and all the different paths that you have and different passions. And I'm hoping that the, these conversations, again, continue, but that you remain engaged whether it's with Natissel, with other organizations, but that you stay connected because we're, you know, we're really getting better at sharing resources that are useful. Um, and, you know, again, you need to let us know what you need from us as well. Um, so hopefully you'll stay um, connected and engaged and we greatly appreciate your, your time and our speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, Lorena, Romina. I, I greatly appreciate your time. Um, you know, spending a little bit of your Saturday with us, really, really appreciate that, so. All right, so thank you very much, and I hope you have a wonderful Saturday. Hopefully, we'll put the uh, recording on YouTube so that we can all see it and share it, um, but if anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to us, and I'll send you a follow-up email with some more resources, okay? All right, thank you. Have thank a you wonderful so much, Saturday. everyone. Thank You're you. very welcome. Bye. Um, Have a good afternoon. Bye, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. You too. Thank you. Bye.